Oh, man. Thank you, Randy. Uh, hey, just a few things I want to uh, make note of that are happening here at Harvest. Uh, Operation Christmas Child Program, that's what all those boxes, those shoe boxes are happening out in the lobby. I uh, just want to say a big thank you. You guys did a great job last week. Uh, I don't think we had any boxes left. I've seen people walking out with two, three, even four boxes, and so that was awesome. I want to say thank you. I think it's a testimony to Harvest, their, their giving, their heart. Um, the rest of the month, though, if you, if you didn't get one, you still want one, we're going to have boxes out there throughout the month. Just return it back to the table. Uh, missions commitment card, if you open up this bulletin here, there will be one inside. Uh, we're not collecting them right now, but uh, in a couple weeks we will be. I just wanted to make a note that we're going to see a video in a second uh, on the giving. But uh, before I do, I just want to uh, let you know, maybe encourage you to take that home and pray over it. Maybe ask God what he would lay on your heart to give towards the missions program here. Um, we're going to watch the video now real quick, though. Two last things. Uh, if you're interested in our music ministry, maybe you've, you know, for a while I've been wondering, how do I get in there? How do I, how do I become a part of the music ministry? Uh, we have an open house October 16th, uh, next Sunday at 5 p.m. Come, there's going to be a rehearsal. You get to see what that would kind of look like. And then afterwards, there's food. So that's always a good thing. When you offer free food, people will come. Uh, and lastly, uh, Trunk or Treat, Friday, October 21st, 6 to 8 p.m. That's one of our biggest outreach events uh, here at the church. Um, and so if you're interested, you and your family, uh, sign up on harvestbaptist.info, and uh, that would be great. We're going to watch a video now. And then uh, Pastor Mark's going to come. Well, I love October. The crisp air, the Renshaw Farms excursions, the colors of the changing leaves. But what I love most of all about October is Missions Month. All month long, we get to explore what God has been doing through the missions program here at Harvest. Today, we get to celebrate and highlight what God is doing internally. And out of all the many things that God is doing, there is none more exciting to me than what's been unfolding internally. Missions efforts led by members of our church. See, part of the reason Harvest has a strong missions mindset is that we understand the importance of encouraging and resourcing members of our church to engage in missional work. Your generosity has allowed us to be a sending church to the Stokes and the Gall families. The Stokes are back in Vanuatu full-time, continuing their discipleship and work on a Bible translation for the Tiale people. This year, the Gauls made the decision to step out on faith, sell everything, and move to Macedonia to engage in missions work full-time. As missionaries sent out of our church, it is a joy to invest significantly in these families every single month and have their backs as they work to make the name of Jesus great in foreign fields. Your generosity also allows us to spearhead projects that make an unbelievable impact on people's lives. This year, we hosted our fourth annual and largest ever Shop with the Heroes. We matched up 40 first responders with foster children and families in need from our community, and then we sent them on a Walmart shopping spree. They got clothes and toys and groceries, and we were able to share the gospel of Jesus with each of them. We were also able to serve as a regional hub for Operation Christmas Child. We packed more than 500 boxes and processed countless more for local partners around the world. These shoe boxes are filled with small toys and hygiene items and school supplies, and we distributed these to children as a means of reaching those communities with the good news of Jesus Christ. This last year, our academy students and staff packed and sent more than 30,000 meals to Madagascar to help feed children affected by poverty and famine and disease in our second annual Rise Against Hunger. Every year, there are legitimate financial needs that we meet for members of our church, and we couldn't do it without your generosity. This year, we helped with unforeseen medical bills. We repaired some cars for widows and single moms. There were some unexpected funeral expenses we covered. We even bought some groceries for families that lost jobs, and that's just to name a few. We were also able to send two teams from our church to the Dominican Republic. On these trips, we drilled a life-changing well in a community without city water. We laid over 1,000 blocks. We passed out thousands of Spanish New Testaments. We distributed 4,000 pounds of food. We ran outreach events for children and basketball players. But best of all, we were able to see people accept Jesus as their Lord and come to faith on these trips. 
As a matter of fact, we are thrilled to announce an upcoming mission trip to Honduras in 2023. This trip will be approximately seven days and there's something for everyone to do. There's construction projects and outreach events and working with kids, you name it. For more information, you can come to our missions meeting today right after the service, or you can contact Pastor Dom. So to each of you that have given to our church missions program over the past year, I just wanna say a big thank you and keep it up. Your generosity makes an eternal difference and your generosity impacts lives. Well, it's exciting to see all of the many ways that uh, our funds get to be distributed uh, really around the world, but through our church and our region and our nation and all over the place for our missions program. I do want, so here's the deal. I want 20 of you to go on that trip to Honduras. And I know if 20 of you go to Honduras this upcoming January, then 40 of you need to go to the interest meeting today. And if 40 of you go to the interest meeting, then I have to ask 80 of you to go. So I'm going to pick... I'm going to pick these 80 right here. I'm going to ask you to go to the interest meeting. But seriously, I hope that all of you will consider it. Take 15 minutes, go there right after the service, and uh, just at least learn what's happening. Maybe it's not you. Maybe your grandkid wants to go. Uh, but that's going to be exciting for us to do, and I hope that you'll be there. Revelation chapter number 1. We started this last Sunday, and I normally do not review a sermon uh, but in light of the book and wanting to get this book launched in a good way and have a solid foundation, I will review very briefly the first three verses that we covered last Sunday, and then we'll move into some new territory and cover verses 4 through 8 today. So if you would, get to Revelation 1, very back of the book, last book of the Bible, and let's look in verse number 1 and let's read it together and try to understand this. Revelation 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Now these verses are extremely important to the whole book. Because they are relatively programmatic, and we learned last week that you will have studied Revelation wrong if a few things. So you've studied wrong if you don't have a larger, grander, fuller view of Jesus, because it is the revelation of Jesus, meaning Jesus is the one who reveals, yes, but Jesus is the one being revealed, and you should see more of Jesus when it's all said and done, because he is the focal point of the book. You also learn that you've done it wrong if you leave the book with more questions than answers. And Revelation is this book that many people are intimidated by, and they think it's just surrounded by question marks, but it's a revealing, the revelation. It's not the concealing. It's not the hidden secret and the, the codes that you have to crack and cipher. It's supposed to be an uncovering and a revealing of something. And God does not reveal everything in the book. But there are certain things that he reveals with certainty, and you want to major on those. The third thing is you've, you've studied wrong if you leave more scared than blessed. There are some, quote-unquote, scary parts to the book, but if you read in verse number three, it tells you that blessed is the one who reads and blessed is the one who hears. This is a book of blessing, not a horror film. And if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, then there are some things to be legitimately scared about. But if you are a servant, as verse number one would put it, if you know Jesus as Lord, then you don't need to be scared. You need to be blessed. And most specifically, you will be edified by the book. You'll be built up by it. You'll be encouraged by the book. And you'll be comforted by the book. And when we travel the road of Revelation, we are on a road that is rewarding. This is a book of blessing. Number four, you've studied wrong if there's no practical application. Because blessed is the one who, who reads and who hears and who keeps the things that are written therein. 
there are lessons to learn. There are commands to keep. This is more than charts and graphs and trying to figure out timelines and just have a bunch of head knowledge. There is shoe leather Christianity, something we can walk on. There, you should leave the book knowing how to serve Jesus better, how to think more properly, how to act in the world in light of Jesus being your Savior. There is practicality to the book, and we don't want to miss it. And then lastly, you've studied wrong if Revelation does not connect to current events at all, or it always connects to current events. So there are things in the news that will have a bearing on this that, that correspond. It's not like there's nothing in the headlines that lines up with Revelation, but not everything in the headlines line up with Revelation. And there is a tendency for people of really every decade to think that this applies exclusively to them, and it's not the Revelation of 22, and it's not the Revelation of America, and it's not the Revelation of the Biden administration. It's the Revelation of Jesus, and it's meant to serve the church globally, not just us right here in Western PA. So that's the first three verses. Now on to new territory. You're not in the introduction, but you are in this bit of a prologue, and I want to take my time with it this morning. Because you need to understand the first three verses, you also need to understand uh, the next few verses because they lay a really broad foundation that will serve us well through the, through the remaining 22 chapters of the book. So first you see in, in verse number four, the author and the audience. So it says, verse number four, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia. So John is the human author who penned the words, speaking of John the apostle. John was someone who was... Uh, fishing, and Jesus called him to himself, and John got a front row seat to Jesus' ministry and traveled with him through the entire ministry. John became, humanly speaking, Jesus' best friend. He was the disciple whom Jesus loved. He was the closest one to Jesus. John was there at the Mount of Transfiguration. John was there in the Garden of Gethsemane. John was there at the foot of the cross when they crucified Jesus. When all the other disciples ran away, John was there. And it was John to whom Jesus commended his mother and said, John, I want you to take care of Mary now that I will be gone. It was John who became this leading apostle and evangelist and enforced in the early church. It was John who wrote the Gospel of John to those who did not believe so that they may, not, so that they may believe. It was John who wrote the epistles of First and Second and Third John. First John we just studied here just a few weeks ago. And now it's John who at the end of his life, probably in his late 80s or early 90s, so any of you who are in your 80s or 90s, which I know is not a ton, but any of you who are there or even 70s, know God has not put you out to pasture. God is not done with you. John, in the latter years of life, is now on the island of Patmos as a prisoner. This is the Alcatraz of the day. They could not kill John, so they, they didn't know what to do with him. They just sequestered him away to this island so that he could die there in seclusion. And here John gets the revelation of Jesus and pins these words. And he pins them to the seven churches which are in Asia. Now, our Asia and first century Asia are different. Asia simply means east. So when we use Asia today, or we, we refer to the continent of Asia, we refer to the far east. And you may think Asia, China, Thailand, Taiwan, that may be what comes to your mind. When first century says Asia, it's talking about a portion of what we would now know today as the Middle East, but it's talking about a portion of modern-day Turkey. We have a map to even show you this. If you looked in the westernmost part of modern-day Turkey, in the first century, there was a region known as Asia or Asia Minor, and that is where there are seven specific churches that John writes to. We will see more about these churches. They're all named, and you get a, a profile of each of them in chapters 2 and chapters 3 of Revelation, and that's coming. But he writes specifically to these local assemblies, these local churches that are there in that region of modern-day Turkey. So you may say, okay, great. John wrote it. He wrote to these seven churches. Uh, can we move on? No, let's not move on. Okay, these things are important. Anytime you want to study the Bible well, and I hope that you want to study the Bible well, you need to be able to identify as best you can who wrote this book? John did. Who did they write to? What is the target audience? As best you can, you want to try to determine 
where did they write from, the provenance? And we'll see that next week. John tells you he writes this from Patmos. Uh, when did they write? What is the date? What is the main subject of what they wrote? You want to be able to identify those as best you can. Most of the books of the Bible, you can get all five of those down. Because those five will determine so much of the context. You need to know who wrote. You need to know who they wrote to to be able to determine what the words mean oftentimes. If someone is writing to an unbelieving audience, as in the Gospel of John, versus writing to a believing audience, as in the Epistle of John or Revelation, that makes a big difference in the words, right? The simplest way to illustrate this, and this, this is a silly illustration, but it'll prove the point. If in September 11, 2001, I sent an email to my ninth grade teacher, I was a ninth grade at the time, and I sent an email to my ninth grade science teacher, and I said, your car is the bomb, Mr. Finneran. Now, if you were a child of the 90s, you would know that the bomb was just lingo for that's cool, or that's hip, or that's nice, or I like it, right? And if you found this, here's an email from Mark to Mr. Finneran, in September the 1st of, of 2001, or September 11th, you would, okay, great, he likes his car. But if you had an email on September the, uh, the, the 1st of, of two, September 11th, excuse me, 2001, that was from Osama bin Laden to Ahmed, that said your car is the bomb, it would all of a sudden have a different meaning, would it not? Now, the words are the same, and the date is the same. But the author and the audience massively changed how you would have perceived those words. And the same is true for any book of the Bible. You have to be able to know who wrote this as best you can and who do they write it to because it determines so much of what the words will mean. So it's important for us to know he's writing to these churches. We'll see more about the churches in a bit. It's important for us to know, okay, these are it's written to believing people, to the servants of Jesus. This will make a difference as we move through the book. So author and audience, then you see it's a book of grace. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace. The word grace is mentioned two times in the book of Revelation. Once right here, and once in the very last verse, chapter 22, verse 21. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, amen. Grace is not anywhere else in the book, but it is bookended by grace, it is meant to teach you that this book is about the grace of God when it's all said and done. The Greeks would open their letters with grace. It was the customary salutation or greeting. The Hebrews opened their letters with shalom or peace. That was the customary salutation. And here, the book is opened with grace and peace. God is big enough to have both. And oftentimes our world does not have grace and peace because they do not know the book of grace and peace and they do not know the God of grace and peace. He says, here is grace, and here is peace, and this is from, from, from. He says it's from someone, from someone, from someone. Read it with me, uh, into verse 4. From him which is and which was and is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth. So three of them. From, first, him which is and was and is to come. We will see the same title used in just a minute to talk about God the Father, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, Him which was and is and is to come. It's saying this is from God the Father. These words are meant to describe an eternal, immutable God. That this grace and peace and this revelation is from Him and from the seven spirits which are before His throne. I am not going to bore you today with a teaching lesson, although I could, I could teach till the day is long, but there's a lot of debate, and you can read pages upon pages upon pages on, okay, what does that mean? But this is from the seven spirits which are before his throne. There are two schools of thought. One is that this is somehow a reference to the Holy Spirit, and that the, the grace and peace is Trinitarian in nature. It's from the Father, from the Son, and from the Spirit. And that the seven spirits means the Holy Spirit. There are four or five different reasons that people list as to why that could be. I don't think that is the case. I think it's best to take it at face value. Seven spirits, meaning angels, 
uh, spirits, there are evil spirits and good spirits. Evil spirits we would know as devils or demons. Good spirits we would know as angels. You will see seven spirits come up again in Revelation, and they're given seven trumpets, that it is God the Father and from these seven angels, which are before his throne. And some have scratched their head and said, that's weird. I don't know, grace and peace from Jesus and from the Father and from the angels. Like, I don't know that those should be lumped together. But they are lumped together in other places in, in the Scripture. You would find, for example, in Luke, that Jesus will come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. You would find in 1 Timothy chapter 5 that I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus and the elect angels. So it's not weird to find the Father, the Son, and the angels grouped together. And this greeting is from the Father and from these seven angels which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ. And as you might expect, there's more press given to Jesus than there is even to the Father or the angels because this is a revealing of Jesus. So it tells you this is from Jesus, and then it describes him in this way, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth. Now hang with me. We're going to get to application in a minute, but hang with me. There's a lot we could say about that in all those descriptors. But the most simple thing I could say is that John is reaching back to Psalm chapter number 89, and he is meshing two verses together from Psalm chapter number 89 about the throne and the seat of David, that God had promised David a throne and an everlasting kingdom, and that his seed would be forever, and that there would be someone who rules and reigns over everyone through his lineage. And John reaches back and he quotes this. We'll put it on the screen for you. These are the verses from Psalm 89. As a faithful witness in heaven... I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. And John quotes that. Now he, he evolves it a little bit, and he, and he says this in Revelation chapter number 1. Jesus, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth. What is he saying? He's trying to communicate to you that the promises that God made to David were sure and were certain and were fulfilled in the Lord Jesus. That Jesus isn't just somebody who burst onto the scene in, in the first century and no one should have been expecting this, but he was prophesied, he was foretold. This is why when you talk about the gospel of Jesus, if you look in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, you are told that the gospel of Jesus is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus as it is written in the scriptures. There's this constant drumbeat of, it was written about. This, this was foretold. This isn't, this isn't a news flash. We knew that this was coming. And he's trying to say that Jesus is the fulfillment of those prophecies. And Jesus is the faithful witness, the prophet. Jesus is the firstborn, the only begotten, the one that has the preeminence. And he's the firstborn of the dead. He is the prototype of what will happen to us, that he raised in immortality and he promises to his followers that that will happen to them one day. Jesus is, in fact, the prophet. He is, in many ways, the priest, and it alludes to his sacrifice. He is the king. He's the prince of the kings. We would say it is king of kings. He is the ruler of the rulers. That that was told about Jesus, that is true about Jesus, that's who he is. And then John gets to what I think is the focal point of verses 4 through 8, that there is grace and glory in Jesus. And here's what he says. Let's cover the grace first. He says, verse number five, unto him that loved us, still talking about Jesus, Jesus, the faithful witness, Jesus, the one who is the firstborn of the dead, Jesus, he is the one who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. This says, there's grace and peace from Jesus. Well, how so? Well, he loves us. And he liberates us. He washes us from our sins. And he lifts us to a position of kings and priests. That's at least part of it. Jesus loves us. Jesus liberates us. Jesus lifts us. You know the love of Jesus, most specifically because of what you're saved from. Right? You're saved from your sins. Jesus loved us. And he, and he washed us from our sins in his own blood. 
that his death on the cross and his atoning work was there to pay for our sins. It was a substitutionary death. That's how you know God loved you. He didn't just tell you. He showed it. God commended his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Right? What does Galatians 2 tell us? He loved me and he gave himself for me. What does 1 John 4 tell us? That herein we know the love of God. That Jesus actually became a propitiation for our sins. He loves us and he saves us from our sins. He saves us from something, but he also saves us for something. He calls us to something. There's a purpose. He has made us kings and priests. Now, I have to stop here for a minute because this is lost on many Christians or maybe they've just never been taught. Saved from your sins, saved for a purpose. He makes us kings and priests. Now, I don't know if you've looked in the mirror anytime recently and said, what's up, king? What's up, priest? But you could. If you know Jesus, this is saying he makes us kings and priests. Kings being the ones who will rule with him. That you are a joint heir with Jesus. That he will rule and reign and he will be in charge of everyone, including you. But... You will rule and reign as well, and we'll see that as we move through the book of Revelation. But there is a kingdom coming, and that we will rule and reign alongside of him. And if you are born again, you are of noble birth, and you're a blue blood. If you know Jesus, you're a blue blood. And he says you're a priest. Now, what's that mean? Well, the Old Testament priesthood was very simple. There's a lot to it, but it's very simple. They were people who had access to God. And they represented man to God. That's how it worked. And there were a bunch of parameters on who could be a priest. You had to be a guy. You had to be of the lineage of Aaron. There were all these parameters, and there was a bunch of things that they did. But in the Old Testament, there was a priest, the people who had a special access to God, who represented man to God, who made sacrifices on behalf of, of man, who went into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement. That this happened. In the New Testament, there are priests, but it is the same but different. The New Testament priests are the people who have access to God, and they represent God to man. They are the people who have direct connection, access to God, and represent God to man. That's the New Testament priesthood. And the Bible tells you plainly, and I mean it's plain Jane, that every person who has put their faith in the Lord Jesus is a priest. And that the idea of you needing a man to go between you and God now is no longer valid. And that anyone who knows Jesus has direct access, meaning you, according to Hebrews, can go boldly to the throne of grace. You can talk to God. And the reason you can do that is because of Jesus, the high priest. This is how the Bible would say it. There is one God. And there is one mediator or go-between between between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. That you have someone who intercedes for you in Jesus. You have someone who has made a sacrifice for you and was a sacrifice in Jesus. And you do not need a go-between. It's the priesthood of the believer. And this says it plainly. That he made you, if you've been washed from your sins, then you are a king and a priest. It's not a special group of people. Now, to be clear, there is order within the church, and God has established a structure in the church, most specifically, for the church to be led by, you could call them pastors, you could call them elders, you could call them bishops, all of those terms would be fitting. So there is leadership within the church, but every single person who is a part of the church of the Lord Jesus is made to be a king and a priest, and while I am happy to pray for you, I do not have a special connection to God because I'm ordained or because I'm a pastor or because I'm preaching to you this morning that you do not have access to. I don't. You have just as much access to God as I have, and it is, it is not only unfitting, I will be so bold as to say, it is a slap in the face of the mediatorship and the high priestliness of Jesus to say that you need someone to go between you and God now. To say that you need someone to absolve you of your sins. 
to say that you need someone to be a priest. That, it's just not true or biblical. Every single believer is a priest. And you have access to God. You can go confess your sins to him. He'll hear from you. You don't, you don't need to go through me or your mom or anybody else. You get to do that. So I want this to sink in this morning, okay? I want you to look to someone on your right, and I want you to look at them, and I want you to say, I'm a blue blood. Go ahead. Do it right now. Look at them. Say, I'm a blue blood. Look at someone on your left. Look on your left and say, hey, I'm a priest. Do you believe that, okay? Now, that's not true if you don't know Jesus as your Savior. So if you just said it and you don't know Jesus, then, then you lied. But uh, he'll, the good news is he'll save you from your sins, including that lie. So that's true of you, though, if, if you are a believer. I, don't, I know business cards are uh, not entirely a thing of the past, but they're not as prevalent nowadays. But if you want to get a business card and you want to put on there, Priest Rich or Priest John or Priest Emily, you could. That would be true. Now, it may cause some questions. Be like, what's up with that? But maybe be a conversation starter. If you want to save me in your phone as priest Mark, knock yourself out. It's true. He has, made, he has saved us from something, our sins. He has saved us for something, to be a king and a priest. Now let's apply it. If you have direct access to God, did you talk to him this weekend? Did you pray to him on Friday? Do you have a conversation? Do you have any fellowship with him on Wednesday? Or did you just let the week go by and you, and you, you didn't take advantage of that privilege? And it is a privilege. If you are a priest and you are meant to represent God to man, how you doing? You representing? You living that out? Do people know more of God because they're in contact with you? Do people know more of God's word because they're in contact with you? Do people know the good news of Jesus because they're in contact with you, that you are his ambassador and you are representing him? If you're meant to be a priest, are you being a priest? Don't celebrate and put it on your business card or save it in your phone as a contact. If you're, if you're not actually going to live it out, live it out. Receive the identity. I'm a blue blood. I'm a priest. Look in the mirror and tell yourself that ten times tomorrow if you have to. And live from that identity you're meant to. You're saved from something, your sin. You're saved for something, some service. You're a king and a priest. The grace of Jesus, he loves us. He liberates us from our sin. He lifts us to a position that we cannot lift ourselves to. But then there's the glory of Jesus. And this kind of turns the corner a little bit, but in a really profound way. Look at the end of verse number 6. To him, Jesus, be glory and dominion forever and ever. And he should get glory, shouldn't he? If he's the faithful witness, if he's the firstborn from the dead, if he's the one who loved us and, and saved us and washed us, if he's the one who lifts us to be kings and priests, if he did all that, then he should get glory. He should have the dominion and the power. That should be for forever, not just temporarily for a little bit. That should be for forever. Amen. Yes, it's true. But then look at verse number 8 or 7. And if you want to study a specific verse from this passage to try to unlock the book of Revelation, take some time this week and study verse number 7. Revelation is a prophecy. And here is your first prophecy. Here it is right here, verse number 7. And this is, in many ways, the thesis statement to the rest of the book. That if you can understand this prophecy that's very compact, that is expounded on in massive ways to the rest of the book, if you can understand this, then you'll get a lot. Verse number 7, behold, he, who he? Jesus. Behold, Jesus cometh with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Now, almost without warning, you get this first prophecy. This is, once again, John is meshing two verses together, and he's direct quoting. He's quoting Daniel chapter number 7. That says, Behold, one like the Son of Man comes in the clouds of heaven. And he's quote, quoting Zechariah chapter number 12. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him. And he puts them together. Both of these talking about the second coming of Jesus. Both of these talking about 
God coming in power and glory and ruling and reigning, and he puts them together to say, hey, here's a prophecy. He's going to come in the clouds. Not meaning literally he will be, in, in, you know, shrouded by a cloud, although that may happen, but saying he's coming from the heavenlies. I've heard people say, well, it's not a cloudy day. Jesus must not be coming today. Like, that's not, that's taking it too far. If it's clear skies, that doesn't mean he's not coming. It's meant to say that he's coming from the heavenlies. It says, he, every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. Big group, small group. Big, you don't get any bigger than every eye. All of them. Everybody. This will be global. This will be cosmic. This will not be a localized event. This will be massive. Jesus will come again from the clouds. He will come from the heavenlies. And when he does, every eye shall see him. And they also which pierce him. And that's the reference to Zechariah 12. What that is referring to is specifically the Jewish people. And if you study Zechariah 12, it will become abundantly clear. Now what he's saying is, well, let me back up a step. God never wanted to love the Jewish people to the exclusion of the world. I don't know if any of you follow Pastor Skelly on his, uh, he has a, a podcast, Pastor Skelly, if you're new, pastored here for 20 years, and he has a podcast with a devotional every day. And someone told me recently, he has a, a he went through Revelation, like not too long ago, and I had no idea. I was like, oh, I need to check this out. And he, he does a great job of talking about this for about 10 minutes on his uh, podcast from Revelation 1, verses 7 and 8. And I would encourage you to go listen to it. That God never wanted to love the Jewish people to the exclusion of the world. He wanted to love and bless the world through the Jewish people. If you read the Old Testament, that's clear. Now God is loving and blessing the world through the church. But that script will flip back. And the Jewish people who rejected their Messiah, who was promised the one who is going to come and have the throne of David, and they rejected him, and they put him on a cross, that those people will be regathered again, and they will, after a time of great tribulation, they, and you'll see this in Revelation as we walk through it, they will turn their attention back, and they will recognize that the Messiah that they crucified was, in fact, the Messiah, and they will turn back to Jesus. And he's saying that everyone will see him, but specifically, let me mention Zechariah 12 and say that there's a group of people, the Jewish people, who, who pierced him and put him on the cross, and they were responsible for his death, that they will see him as well in a special way. And here comes Jesus for the second coming, and it says these words, which may trouble you or scare you, I'm not sure. But it says that he will come, and all, all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Now, what's up with that? That doesn't wailing doesn't sound pretty. This doesn't sound comforting. This doesn't sound grace filled. Like I like all that all that grace of Jesus stuff, loving me and lifting me and liberating me. Now we're talking about the glory of Jesus and that He's going to come back again and that that promise is sure and that when He comes there will be there will be wailing there will be dread. Yes. You would see this, if, if you read your Bible with honesty, you would see this not just intimated, but clearly told all through the New Testament. That Jesus will judge. And that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And that this may, this may not be the Sunday school Jesus that, that you got to know when you were a kid. You probably got to know baby Jesus, right, Christmas time, and manger Jesus. And you probably got to know what a lot of the Gospels are about, the healing Jesus and the teaching Jesus and the miracle work in Jesus. And if you know the Gospels at all, that you, you would know the, the dying Jesus, the resurrecting Jesus, and thank God for that and for Easter. But it doesn't stop there. There's a second coming Jesus who is a fierce Jesus and a judging Jesus and a just Jesus and if you don't know him, that's scary. I don't, I don't know how else to put it, but the text will tell you plainly, they will wail at this. That there will be a time when Jesus returns and all of the wrongs will be made right. And all of the crooked will be made straight. And there will be 
at that time, not mercy and not grace, but justice. Justice, God giving us what we deserve. Mercy is God not giving us what we do deserve. We deserve judgment. We deserve his wrath. Mercy is when you're excluded from that. Grace is God giving us uh, uh, what we don't deserve, that he gives us eternal life, and he gives us forgiveness of sins. But there will be a time of justice that is emphasized here in this prophecy that Jesus will come. And Jesus will be scary. And honestly, if, and I'm telling you the truth, I want a God that could beat you up. I want to serve a God like that. I don't want to serve a God that couldn't beat you up. And I'm not saying he wants to beat you up today. Not at all. Don't misunderstand me. Where is this? Why? But you want a big God. You want a powerful God. At least you should. I'm glad that we can talk about the love of Jesus and the grace of Jesus and, and the, the kind heart of Jesus and the gentleness of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus, but may we not miss the second coming of Jesus and the line of the tribe of Judah. He was a lamb that was slain, but he will be a lion that roars. And those are one and the same. Those aren't different people. And I think that we can get this. If you... If you have a good mom, how many of you had a good mom? Raise your hand if you had a good mom. All right. If you had a good mom, then you get this. You get gentle nurturing and fierce all wrapped into the same person. Do you not? Right? That same mom who loves you and cares for you and can hold you or snuggle you or all that sort of stuff, that same mom can also give you that, that mom look. You know what I'm talking about? Where she gets so straight-faced and so serious that whatever you're doing, you know, you better stop or you're dead. You know what I'm talking about? Where mom in an instant, she can just be going along talking to somebody and just, I mean, nail you with that look. Where she looks into your soul and says with no words, I will tear you limb from limb and I, I will eliminate you if you do that again. Right? The, the old, I brought you into this world, I can take you out of this world look. Now, dads don't have this ability. Dads, when you do something stupid and, and your kid, dads can get angry sometimes, but generally dads look at you like just befuddled. Like, what are you doing? Like, that's the dumbest thing. But moms will look at you, and I mean, you're, you're, you know that look, right? All the moms in the room, on the count of three, can you give me that look? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I don't want to be scared. <clears throat> we can understand something of someone being kind and gentle and nurturing and fierce in the same person. And I hope that we can understand that Jesus is gentle. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. He took upon him the form of a servant, and he humbled himself. And he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. I hope that we can appreciate and love Jesus in that way, but I also hope that we can appreciate and love the Jesus that Revelation portrays. Because he's not coming for a, co a cross, he's coming to conquer. He's not coming for a tree, he's coming for a throne. He's not coming oozing with mercy and grace, he's coming oozing with justice. And those are the same person. And you, and you don't miss one or the other. You, you, don't, you don't fall into a ditch on either side of the road there. You have to have both. There's this allusion to this in the New Testament that I love, and I mention it probably once a year because it, it's so impactful to me, where Matthew talks about Jesus fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah and when, he, when Matthew chapter number 12, it says of Jesus, a bruised reed he shall not break, and a smoking flax he shall not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory. Now what, is, what does that mean? That means that Jesus has no compromise between strong and tender. That means that Jesus is just and righteous to the nth degree, but he is also melt in your mouth gentle to the nth degree, and he's both wrapped into the same person. And most specifically, it is saying that Jesus is a person of, of absolute power and majesty, that he will bring forth judgment unto victory. But in the meantime, he is so sensitive and so tender and so gentle 
that a bruised reed, a reed that is almost broken, he won't break it. He will handle it with such care, even though it's fragile. And a smoking flax, the, the, the flame is almost out. He won't quench that, that he will handle with care and he will be so gentle, but don't mistake him for a little puppy. Don't, don't think that he is just the slain lamb and not the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he's not a tame lion. That both come together. And frankly, to make this very applicable, both should come together in Christian. This is why we are admonished to speak the truth, to hold the line, to stand for righteousness and to not shy away from that, but to do it with love and to do it with words that are winsome to do it with speech that is flavorful, right? And I, I see this all the time in Christians and in churches that they emphasize one Jesus over another. And they either take the Jesus who was uh, at times sarcastic, at times some really tense moments, you, you know, generation of vipers and you den of thieves, and he's flipping tables over in the temple and, and you know, driving people out with a whip and all kinds of stuff. And they take that Jesus and like, let's be like that. And let's just uh, all the time. And then there's other people that look at Jesus, you know. He's a friend of sinners. And, and he's, he's helping the woman at the well. And here's this woman caught in adultery. And he doesn't judge her or condemn her. He helps her. And let's just be loving. And let's just be kind. And let's just have a heart for people. And it's not one or the other. We do love. And we do have compassion. And we do have tenderness. But there also should be this grittiness, if I could say it that way. And this, and this rigidity to know truth is truth, and that's right, and this is what he said, and we're not backing away from it, and there's, there's a balance to be had in Christians, right? You don't take one over the other. And you see in Revelation 1, verses 6, verses 7, Jesus is a Jesus of grace. He loves, he liberates, he lifts, and Jesus is a Jesus of glory who will come in power and judgment and dominion, and it's a scary thing if you don't know it. It's both. Both. Verse number 8. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord. And there's debate as to, is this, is this talking about Jesus or the Father? And I, I think it's talking about the Father, going back to him. Which is and which was and which is to come, we saw that earlier, the Almighty. And what this is meant to communicate, if you put it all together, is that you can bank on what he just said. So we've broken it all down. Let me, let me seam it together and we'll be done. There is this verse that Jesus is the one who was prophesied about, Psalm 89, the prophecy of the seed and the throne of David. And this came true, that Jesus is the faithful witness, that Jesus is the firstborn, that that came true. And then immediately into, well, here's something that is, is not going, it hasn't happened yet. Here's this prophecy that Jesus will come, the second coming of Jesus. And this is a scary thing if you don't know him. And let me tell you that this is true too. You're meant to get this, this sense of that was, that was promised about Jesus and it, and it was fulfilled. And this is promised about Jesus and I can take it to the bank. This is, the one, this is coming from the Alpha and the Omega. That's like saying A to Z. This is coming from the one who is and was and is to come. It's coming from God. It's coming from the Almighty, the beginning and the end. That this is coming from God. I can take this to the bank. It hasn't happened yet. But just as the first part was fulfilled, the second part will be fulfilled. Know that it's true. Rest on it. As Randy's saying, your anchor can hold. That's not moving. That's not changing. There's an almighty God who has promised, and these things are certain. Now, more to come on this because that, that prophecy in Revelation 1.8 or 1.7 is expanded on through the rest of the book. But you can know in a nutshell that this is true, and you can trust the word of God. Promises are as true as the one who makes them. And when you read verse number 8, you realize it doesn't get any more certain than that. It doesn't get any more true than that. It doesn't get any more trustworthy than that. That's something special. We're talking about God. But he says, here it is. The grace of Jesus is real. If you don't feel like a king or a priest, it's true. And the glory of Jesus is real. He's coming in power and judgment 
and justice. If you don't think that's true, that's true. Because the God Almighty said that it was.